everyone. Welcome to Space Club XV Extended Voyage. Uh, glad to see some of you are already here. Um, no need to diddle daddle. I mean, you guys mostly know why we're here. We used to talk about the last month of planetary science, something we used to do in person in the olden days when we were all at the same campus. We're not anymore, uh, but we can still get together and do the same. So uh, my name is Danny Bednar. I am a part-time assistant professor in the Department of Geography and the Environment at Western University. I also have a nine to five with the Canadian Space Agency uh, and am an author with uh, Mango Books along with Tanya and uh, Tanya Harrison, Tanya of Mars, number one in your hearts, number, I was just looking it up and the countdown wasn't long enough, number three, <laughs> five in Amazon sales of history <laughs> astronomy. So. Uh, Interesting, okay. Yeah, that, that's our category. Um, and then also joining us, Dr. Phil Stuck, uh, Professor Emeritus from the Department of Geography at Western University, author of many books and atlases about the solar system and all the things we're going to talk about today. So um, thanks, both of you, for being here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Be able to do it by myself, obviously. Um, <clears throat> so as usual, we're going to start with uh, a little bit of space on this day, a little bit of space history. Uh, let me just pull up my notes here. Um, so we're, what are we at today? Uh, April, October, April 20th. <laughs> it feels uh, like 20th. October already. It, <laughs> but I don't know if it's last October or future October. <laughs> the time means nothing anymore. But uh, uh, it, this date in 1962, we had Ranger 4. Now I'm at, I've had to dig into some of these history on this day in the past, you know, unwillingly having to do human space flight or astronomy, my unpreferred space topics, but this time I actually get to do robotic space flight. Um, so Pioneer, uh, sorry, Ranger 4 um, was a uh, one of the American missions to the moon in the early 60s, April 62. Um, and at this point, the Soviets and the Americans are still vaguely flinging things at Mars. So if we step uh, Mars at the moon, so if we step back a few years, uh, we have the first three American attempts with the Pioneer missions in late 1958. They all kind of fail either at launch or in Earth orbit. We have uh, Luna 1, which is a Soviet first shot. It fails, but it does roughly break Earth orbit. Uh, we get the Americans firing back, March 59. Uh, they miss the moon with Pioneer 4, and they they arguably hit a distant lunar flyby, although they're quite far. Uh, Luna 2 is the first thing to hit the moon, so this is the Soviets with a pretty big, uh, I guess, accomplishment. In uh, late September 59, Luna 3 follows up with the first successful images returned from the moon. Uh, for the next few years, we have a bunch of failed launch attempts towards the moon from both the Americans and the Soviets. Keep in mind, early 60s, we're starting to have them both paying attention to humans in orbit. So this is when Gagarin's going up, Glenn and Shepard on the American side. Uh, so we get a break, a bit of a break until Ranger 3, January 62, early 62. Um, Ranger 3, so the one before, the one celebrating its, its anniversary today, uh, Ranger 3 was supposed to hit the moon, but it missed. Um, today, it would be relatively, at least comparatively, easier to hit the moon. But at the time, uh, just getting out towards the moon was uh, impressive. So Ranger 4 followed up April 62, launched April 23rd, 1962. Uh, the objective was to smash into the moon, which Ranger 3 tried to do, and take pictures on its way down. Um, Ranger 4, unfortunately, missed the moon. Uh, as well. Uh, sorry, no, it hit the moon. It did hit the moon, but it didn't uh, send anything back. So half of a success. Uh, yes. It had a camera on board. It had a spectrometer, an altimeter. Um, and actually, it had a little seismometer, which if they landed or if they crashed soft enough, uh, the seismometer may have survived and been able to sense. Right. So let's just add a little bit of, uh, of detail <laughs> to this. Okay. Uh, the, the round thing on top of your picture there is yeah, it's the round thing. Is, is the uh, the landing capsule, and right underneath it is a thing that sort of looks like a canister, which was a little braking rocket. 
So the idea was that the main spacecraft would just plummet to the surface and crash into it, although it did have a camera to take some pictures on the way down. Um, but the top part would be ejected and its little rocket would try to slow it down to a survivable speed and then it would hit the surface. Uh, and uh, inside that capsule, there was a, a seismometer which would provide a little bit of data if they could get it to land successfully. They never did that. So the, this, this design applied to ranges three, four, and five, and uh, they all failed one way or another. Only Ranger four hit the moon. Uh, and after that, they redesigned the spacecraft. So the remaining rangers, six, seven, eight, and nine, did not have a landing capsule, but they had a greatly expanded uh, camera system. And those are the ones, three of those are the ones that actually succeeded. Yeah, so six hit the moon again, unable to send back uh, any data. Seven yeah. was the first great success, July of 64. Yeah. Eight and nine follow that up uh, by this time we're well into the development of the Apollo program. So these are some of the images uh, early on that are giving some clues as to how we might be able to land on this thing by yeah. humanity. Um, yeah, what was I gonna say? Yeah, it wouldn't be until May 66 surveyor lands, the first soft landing by either the Americans or the Soviets. It's the Americans actually nab that early on. Um, but uh, a lot of the early successes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's uh, not forget, oh. Luna 9. the Soviet Luna 9 was the first thing that actually landed safely just a few months before Surveyor 1. Yeah, you're right. Okay. <laughs> We've got a good question from Phil in the audience rather than Phil on the webcam. Uh, are there are the Lunas and Rangers that missed the moon still in orbit around the sun? Uh, yes. Just guess. <laughs> yes. Just yeah, Luna 9 and 10 earlier in 66 had already both not only landed, but uh, orbited as well. Not 10 orbited. Yeah. Uh, that's right. 9 hit or soft landed. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, yeah, I put my notes in the wrong order. Okay, so that's space in this day with some assists from Phil. Thanks, Phil. Mm -hmm. um, so previously on Space Club, we left around here um, <clears throat> with with Perseverance, the new Mars rover, Percy getting ready to drop or lay an egg of its uh, Ingenuity spacecraft nicknamed Ginny. Um, so this was early-ish April um, where this was getting laid. Um, we'll kind of jump over here. Uh, interestingly, Ginny does have a camera on board I think it's like a 13 megapixel camera. Um, and it, it did snap a picture just after it had been birthed. Uh, you can still see the rover sitting there. And this is uh, one of the NASA releases after the rover had driven away. So it, it laid it down from underneath, drove away, uh, and took this picture with its rear has cam. So this is ingenuity behind it. Uh, and this is a nicer cleaned up image, I imagine, taken from a Hascam, uh, given the angle, uh, cleaned up by Sean Dorian. Sean Dorian. Um, so yeah, let's talk about uh, the plans for Ingenuity, which I imagine you've already seen in the news was successful in flying, but we'll, we'll jump back a little bit to some of the plans. So the smallest square you can see is is where the rover left ingenuity and then drove away this the bigger square moving outwards is its takeoff and landing zone and then the longer rectangle as well as the line moving through it that line is kind of the flight path expected and the the, the wider flight zone um at least for the early flights that that line um so keep that in mind because we're going to see uh right away <laughs> ingenuity is able to do and how cool is it that we have a map like that on another planet? Like, just mm -hmm. to emphasize that, that's amazing. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. It's been nice. It's pretty good. <laughs> I'm biased. It's Mars. I think it's cool. It is, yeah. <laughs> uh, so then an artist rendition of, of I guess, the, the big scale plan for um, upwards of five flights. And I'm sure Phil can talk about that shortly. Um, so 
this has already started, but Phil, if you want to, this is the first flight, the video. Um, right, yeah. So this first one just went uh, up three meters and then back down again, just to basically show that they could control it um, and that it was steady enough in flight that uh, um, that they could take Whoop. it. On. There it goes. <laughs> Whoa. It's so around cute. A little bit. They, uh, There's a little, yeah, a little twirl. Yeah, a little twirl, 90 degrees. Yeah. That's so that the camera would face towards uh, the rover, but uh, um, well, I think they were supposed to take a picture, but for some reason it didn't get taken. I don't know why. Uh, and then they go back down and landed almost exactly where they took off, so nicely controlled. So that was the first flight. It didn't do very much. Second so, flight. so the second flight, this was the objective. This wasn't from the first flight, right, Phil? This is from the second, but this is uh, an image taken looking downwards. Yes, looking downwards at its own shadow. Yeah. Six more weeks of spring. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so this is the second flight already in the air. Uh, I don't know why it starts in the air, but uh, a little bit more twirling. That's right. So this time, uh, the sideways looking camera took three pictures. Uh, one, I guess one towards the rover, one to the north and one uh, in the opposite direction away from the rover. Uh, three pictures, um, which we've got on, back on Earth now. Uh, and uh, again, it was they, they also did a little sideways movement, just a couple of meters and then back again and then back down. And again, they landed almost exactly at the same place they took off. Uh, but they tested out the sideways movement as well. So uh, they're, they're checking things each time. Uh, just gradually expanding what they can do. And then the third flight was much more. Yeah, so genies over here uh yeah this one <laughs> this one's great uh there we go so um the second flight and this one both went up to a height of uh, uh five meters instead of three but this time they flew off about 50 meters they go out of the picture <laughs> bye uh, it's just <laughs> funny yeah the last cam uh, that took these pictures wasn't able to track it uh, but the nav cam uh, camera, which has a wider it's coming field, back, it's coming back. The whole thing, yeah. <laughs> Eventually, <laughs> yeah, it'll be here. It's okay. It's tech demo. It's fine. If it crashes, it at least flew. Hey, <laughs> hey. Ooh, hey, guys. <laughs> and then it goes back. Uh, yeah, it goes back down. Obviously. I was waiting for it to just fly out the other side of the frame. <laughs> whoa, whoa. There we go. <laughs> Did it. There we go. Mission accomplished. Rover. Yeah. Mission. Um, so we're probably due for another flight in a couple of days, but I haven't heard the plans for it, but it will probably be more, um, more ambitious again. Do you like some figure eights? More twirls? <laughs> loop the loop? Yeah. Um, so yeah, Ingenuity was a success in terms of, I, I imagine they've already hit the success check mark. So now it's just like, they what? probably have. Yeah. Um, I guess a few questions, I don't know if they'll come up in the chat, but the things I've seen the most coming up is, okay, if it survives, it's kind of five flight tech demo. Do you, yeah. does it just get abandoned? Um, right. is, is there any chance it would follow the Rover? Uh, Phil, I don't know if you've heard anything on that. Oh, well, lots of people are saying, oh, they really ought to do that. But uh, um, I don't think it's uh, it's practical. Um, uh, for one thing, they ch deliberately chose a very, very nice, smooth, safe uh, place to take off from and land on. And I think the landing is the important part. So if they get into a, a mode where they're following the rover, the rover might drive 50 meters in a day, 100 meters in a day even, getting into different kind of terrain but they wouldn't have they wouldn't have a, a necessarily a nice smooth area for the uh for ingenuity to land in uh so um i don't think it's feasible for it to follow uh, the rover in that way the by the time this has done its its few flights and and checked out all the systems it really will have done its job and after that it would just be kind of a drain on the on the system for uh, for perseverance which has got its own very important mission to 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 do, right? Tanya, are you going to let Phil call Ingenuity <laughs> Brain on the system? 
I mean, it's a technology demonstration. It's not actually part of the science mission of the rover. So, oh, wow. you know, as, as adorable as it is, and as much as I would love to have it, you know, tag along with the rover for longer, uh, the rest of the mission is kind of on a pause while they do all of this stuff. And then, you know, the rover needs to continue on its way and make it over to the Delta Jezero and start getting into those nice layers and yeah, start answering right. that question of whether there was life on Mars and t collect samples. So there's a lot of other cool stuff in store for Perseverance as a, as a mission. So, you know, as sad as it will be to say goodbye to Ingenuity, like we'll see more cool stuff on Mars. Yeah, yeah but Perseverance can't fly. <laughs> this is true. Uh, the other big news out of Mars was uh, the MOXIE experiment, which was a uh, essentially a, a test to see if you could synthesize, pull out oxygen from the Martian atmosphere. There's not a ton of it, uh, and this has ramifications in the distant future for things that tend to breathe oxygen like us. Uh, Tanya, you tend to keep up with, uh, well, humanly things. Uh, Anything do you follow it up with on Moxie? Uh, not much other than seeing that it worked, which is really exciting. This is technology that we have on Earth that we can use for things like carbon capture and sequestration. So it's cool not only to have this as something on Mars to provide breathable oxygen for astronauts in the future, um, providing oxygen that you might need for other things like rocket propellant generation, um, but you could build technology like this on Earth to help combat some of the effects of climate change. So um, actually one of the folks that worked on this, Klaus Lackner, is a professor at Arizona State University where I used to work. And uh, he's working on something that is basically an artificial tree that will take CO2 from the air as wind blows through it and do exactly what MOXIE is doing. It will pull in the CO2, rip off uh, carbon monoxide and oxygen and then and, and release oxygen into the air. So it's cool to see this sort of technology transfer between different planets in ways that can benefit life here on Earth now and humans on Mars eventually in the future. Cool. cool. Right. And I think that's it for uh, for a quick update on Mars, although we'll give a quick heads up for anything. I don't know if there'll any, be any as big news items as uh, both Ingenuity and MOXIE, but uh, I guess the rover will get back in action in terms of moving. Phil, what's well, up? Oddly enough, the rover actually drove today. I wasn't expecting uh -huh. it. It moved um, maybe uh, eight or ten meters, something like that, um, perhaps to a slightly better vantage point for following up the um, uh, uh, the last couple of flights of the helicopter. I'm not sure. All right. Well, we'll look forward to an update in another month. Uh, okay. on, uh, Perseverance has been up to, but now. We're actually going to turn back to our old friend, the moon, with Phil. So yeah, that's right. And uh, believe it or not, it's still there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So um, uh, I uh, I wanted to just say a few things about uh, things that have been happening on the moon recently and will be coming up uh, through the rest of this year in the next 12 months or so. Um, so uh, there's a good old moon and a Apollo 16 image, um, which... Uh, shows the near side of the moon, the side that faces us, Earth's facing side on, on the left, uh, and on the right-hand side, we're getting into the far side, which is just totally covered with craters there, at least in that region. Yeah, okay, so um, let's uh, go on and see, well, yeah, see what we're doing here. There we go. Um, so first, uh, I wanted to look at Chang'e 4, which is the, the Chinese mission on the uh, far side of the moon, the only thing that has ever landed safely on the far side of the moon and operated and it's still active today uh, it's been there for more than two years uh, in fact it's just ended its 29th lunar day or month of uh, of operation um, so it's sort of in uh, the 29th lunar night right now um, it's driven over 700 meters uh, and that might seem like slow going but this rover is doing a lot of science along the way um, including using a ground penetrating radar, they call it lunar penetrating radar, that uh, uh, that can penetrate down into the surface and look at uh, layers beneath it. Uh, and it's got a continuous track of that um, uh, uh, over the entire traverse. Uh, and it's stopping and looking at things all the time with its uh, visible and infrared spectrometer to get composition data. So it's doing a lot of work along the way. Um, and uh, that's partly why it's going slowly. 
Uh, okay. So here's a very nice example that was just published in Earth and Planetary Science Letters um, by Zhang et al. Uh, there's a reference uh, down there. And this is about using the lunar penetrating radar to map uh, the layers beneath the rover. Now, this um, uh, the rover landed in a big crater called von Karman. Uh, and when you look at images of von Karman, it's got a very, very smooth, flat floor, uh, which um, is, seems to be lava flows, basalt lava flows. But the rover did not land on the basalt. It landed on a layer of ejecta, stuff thrown out of impact craters, uh, that sits on top of the lava flow. And right now they're trying to drive um, um, about another thousand meters or so. So in other words, it's going to take quite a long time. Um, uh, but to, uh, to get to the nearest place where they can actually sample that, uh, that basalt. But in the meantime, they're just driving across layers of ejecta, stuff thrown out of other impact craters. And when they look down into the surface with this uh, uh, lunar penetrating radar, um, they can see multiple layers, and they're kind of uh, illustrated in these uh, cross-section diagrams. Um, and they've been seeing these things across much of the, uh, the traverse. But in the middle, they discovered a place where that pattern was quite disrupted, uh, and they've interpreted it as a buried impact crater. So the idea would be that you would have, uh, maybe uh, underneath it, you've got some of these lava flows. But then on top of that, you'd have a layer of ejector from one nearby impact, and a layer of ejector from another nearby impact, and another layer of ejector, and so on. And then at some point, a layer of ejector is thrown out across the surface, and then something comes down and digs a crater in that. And then another big impact throws another 10 meters or so of, uh, of ejector right over the top of that. So this buried crater, which is more than 100 meters across, is, uh, is not at all visible at the surface. It's completely buried. Uh, but it's detectable in this data set. Um, and one of the things they're trying to do now is to get a handle on what the sources of the different ejector layers might be. Um, there are quite a few large craters around that could be the sources. Uh, and so they're, uh, they're kind of trying to decide what the relative ages of the different layers are and, uh, and how, how they might have built up one, one above another uh, through uh, through these multiple impacts um, and ideally you know at the end of it you you would be able to figure out which crater had formed the top layer that you're actually driving on because that's what you're getting your composition data from um, so uh, it, this is this work is going on all the time and there have been quite a few publications coming out of the the team operating this this is just the most recent one uh, but they have quite a few layers and uh, and I'm seeing um, you know, people with different ideas about which craters might have formed each layer. And this so is kind of similar to how we find buried craters on Earth too, right? Yeah. Not through yeah. layers of ejecta, but like oil and gas companies will look for yeah. these buried craters with radar and stuff, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And uh, this next slide is just uh, a map that shows roughly where that crater would be. Now, the thing is, we really just kind of drove across it and we got a, a, a cross section through it, but we don't really know exactly Maybe the, maybe the limb is, uh, I mean, the, the, the rim of this crater might be a little further north or a little further south than I'm showing it, but that's roughly where it would have to be, roughly there. So um, it's not at all visible at the surface. Yeah, so online, like with your updates on the maps, it's been a bit of a tricky uh, handling for you, or, or it sounded like maybe you've got it sort of. Yeah. Why well, and like with the the random stops versus the end of day stops and kind of sorting those out separately. I don't know yeah, yeah, like, that's right. Uh, yeah, so uh, every now and then a, a paper will come out that will describe uh, in detail the uh, analysis that was done on a particular rock or a particular mm -hmm. impact melt in a crater or something like that. Um, so we get uh, sporadically we get uh, extra information about some of these stops. And uh, so I'm always having to try to incorporate that in there as well. I think we've asked this before. Do they are they is the mission team using a naming convention for their features? No, no, we don't really know anything about that. All uh, all we're getting is uh, um, uh, names that show up here and there. Now on this map, you can actually see a couple of those names. So on the the right hand side, 
uh, Qi Yuan um, is um, uh, it means sort of unexpected encounter or unexpected. Oh, yeah, discovery. I saw that. Um, and uh, it was just given by the author of a paper describing the analysis of the of this rock. Uh, then there's another name I've got there, which I'm not going to try to pronounce. Uh, but um, it means companion stones, and it was a little group of stones sitting together on the surface. But that was just in the uh, the caption to uh, uh, an image uh, on one of their, their websites. And I don't know whether it should really be considered a name or not, uh, but I'm using it like a name there. Uh, and we, uh, there are a few others that would appear later on this map, um, but um, there isn't really a... a uh, a kind of formal naming system for anything at the moment. Uh, maybe that will come later. Oh, um, I mean, so Phil asks if they could might go back across that buried crater on another traverse. Um, no, that's not going to happen. It, it's quite a long way behind them already, and they are really keen to get to the, a geologically different area uh, where they hope to get samples of the lava. So. Um, they're not going to go back. That's completely counter to what they regard as important right now, which is to get to a new geological area. Uh, yeah. Did you have anything on this one, Phil? <laughs> well, the craters have no names. Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> well, some of these would. Good idea. Yeah, yeah, well, that's right. Uh, we could use some more space music, I think, definitely. Uh, all right, so, um, oh yeah, that that uh, map just showed craters around the landing site with the sense of uh, now you're uh, you're trying to figure out which which crater has put which layer of ejector onto uh, right. the, the landing site. The the landing site for Chang'e 4, I didn't mark it on there, but it is right at the middle of that image. That's, uh, that's the Von Karman crater. Uh, and there are lots of craters around that could throw stuff into it. Here's a nice little bit of a landscape. See that rock on the left-hand side, and there are two or three others close to it. That is the Companion Stones uh, site. So it's a little place, a group of rocks called the Companion Stones in a, in a figure caption. So anyway, they're getting compositional data. Um, now, when you look at that picture, you can see there's two or three little rocks there, and you can see more off in the distance. But other than that, it's just fine-grained soil. And of course, fine-grained soil is really just millions and millions of tiny, tiny rocks all right, the, the, the lava flows or the stuff that's been dug up by an impact and thrown out on the surface, um, ground up by multiple impacts, uh, so that if you pick it up, you're looking at thousands of rocks and a handful. So when they use their uh, spectrometer on the soil, they, they're looking at lots of grains that could have come from different places, and you get rather a mixed kind of um, uh, analysis uh, 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 of the surface. You don't you don't necessarily know that everything you're looking at in that uh, that one measurement has just come from locally. It could have been thrown in by impacts from somewhere else. But when you get one of those rocks, there you have a chance to get uh, an entire spectrometer measurement on a single chunk that had a single source. And so they've uh, they've measured several of these now, uh, and um, they think that they're looking basically at the um, the floor of the South Pole Aitken Basin, dug up by another impact and thrown in here. Uh, so they think they're getting South Pole Aitken Basin uh, material in those analyses. But they would really like to get one of these uh, basalt lava flow rocks. They haven't found one yet, um, but they keep looking. And so as they drive on, uh, every time they see a rock, I think they will stop and look at it uh, and hope that one of them will turn out to be a basalt and they can get some compositional data from that. And uh, ultimately, but maybe another couple of years, uh, they will get to the place where there is much more basalt material uh, that they can uh, analyze. But you never know when you might break down. So it's a good idea to get that analysis as soon as you can. So they're looking for a rock that's been thrown in from another impact. Well, okay, so let's uh, move on again there. Yeah, I wanted to ask Tony, oh, you probably yeah. know as well, I was reading about, yeah, right. uh, well, space.com ran an article about one of the rocks that they run, they ran uh, VNIS on. Some would describe it as a spallation, a spallation. Is that a oh, a spallation, yeah. 
This is just geology term for like ejecta rock that got thrown around. If I recall correctly, it's like when you have ejecta that then like shoots more stuff off. But I now I feel like I'm in the middle of my PhD defense with Phil all over again. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that was fun, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm trying to remember now, but I I think that might have been the paper. That, there was a lot of fuss at the time made about this funny little blocky crater that had a a patch of impact melt on the bottom of it uh, that was described as gel-like and it made people all excited about gel on the moon but it's really impact class and uh, it's possible that you're referring to that um, and I um, that itself isn't spalled or spallated uh, um, <laughs> maybe the stuff that formed the crater it is I don't know uh, anyway I, I'm not really quite sure about that term okay Let's move on uh, to Chang'e 5. I slid this one in just to oh, make yeah. nice. Yeah. Okay, so yes, the Chang'e 5 lander. It's a nice picture of it. And uh, here they are drilling. Uh, so a little video of the drilling process. They had two different ways of collecting samples. One was to uh, drill down like this. They wanted to go down two meters, but they hit rocks at the depth of a meter and stopped. So they got um, a, a meter core. Um, and uh, then it's kind of drawn back up the tube and wrapped around a cylinder and put into the return capsule. Um, so they've got uh, uh, they've got that sample. Ah, what was that? <laughs> Did you slip in slides into my presentation, Danny? Um, yeah, so we've got that. And then uh, if we can go to the next uh, video without, um, without any monsters leaping in. Uh, this is a, a really cool one, I think. Uh, it shows that a camera Whoa. on the robotic arm um, looking back at uh, part of the lander that wasn't otherwise visible. Um, but when we, we'll see this a third time, and I'll, and I'll say something about it. Uh-oh, we stopped. Ah, oh, there we go. All right. um, no, no, there we are, the horizon. That's looking north uh, behind the lander right there. Uh, and then now those little scratches, dark scratches on the surface are where they scooped up the sample, a second way of collecting a sample. So they had a drill and a scoop on a robotic arm uh, and they scooped up the sample. And actually the majority of what they brought back was scooped up from the surface like that. There are four different little patches where they scooped from. But that's a really nice little video, I think. I'm really happy with Did that. Did this camera... It's so cinematic. It, yeah, yeah. It's, very, it's on a boom, essentially. Was this an engineering camera? like? Or was it taken? Uh, it was the camera that they used to monitor the the actual sampling process. So uh, this was taken after they've done all the sampling. That's what those dark scratches are there. Uh, they, it's after they've done the sampling uh, and they're just taking some uh, pictures because it's cool. Yeah. Yeah, and I always kind of have in my head like the arms on these things moving or kind of stuttered, but this is like really smooth. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Little motion. Nice. Quite nice there. Uh, yeah. I won't scare you again with my background. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's where that came from. Now let's look ahead to yeah, the next yeah. few things that will go to the moon. Uh, sometime in the next few months, and I haven't seen a specific launch date yet. Uh, this little spacecraft called Capstone, which is really just a a, a cube like cube quite set. small, um, will be launched uh, from Mars. Um, but this particular Mars is the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport in Virginia. Mm. Um, I prefer and, the North Atlantic uh, Regional Spaceport. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, it's going to be launched on an electron rocket, and the electron rockets are the ones that usually launch out of New Zealand. Um, but uh, they, this will be the first launch of an electron out of the United States. And I understand that it's actually the certification of the launch vehicle uh, that is delaying the launch because I we were had kind of expected that this would already be at the moon. Anyway, it's going to go to the moon uh, and uh, go into a special kind of uh, orbit, uh, which is this, the same orbit that the Gateway uh, small space station will occupy in the future. The Gateway is a little lunar space station that will be used to support human activities near the moon, uh, and it will be in this uh, special. Uh, uh, orbit, um, which uh, is, it's quite, it, basically it comes down low over the North Pole and then extends very high above the South Pole. And that means that 
uh, orbits always work so that you move quicker when you're close to the thing you're orbiting and slower when you're further away. Uh, so if this is relatively low over the North Pole, it's going pretty fast. And then it goes up very high over the South Pole, so it's moving slowly. So actually it's ten, it, it spends most of its time uh, visible from the South Pole. And then it just comes in and does a quick loop over the North Pole and then it comes back and now it's visible from the South Pole again. So it spends a lot of time visible from the South Pole uh, and it's a carefully chosen orbit that will be torqued by the Sun a little bit so that its orientation always stays the same relative to the Moon and the Earth. It's, um, it's supposed to work in theory but it's never been tested. So this little spacecraft is going to test that orbit and make sure that they really can actually function in this orbit and that it actually will work the way they expect it to. Um, so there's, uh, like, yeah. well, there's been microsats at the moon. Is this the first CubeSat at the moon? Um, now let me see. Um, well, there was that one weird no. one. Um, well, when China sent its um, communication relay satellite to the moon to support the far side landing, it also carried two tiny little satellites like this, uh, called Longjiang One and Two, mm -hmm. and the first one failed. Um, but um, this one, uh, uh, but this, the second one didn't. It it, um, it operated in lunar orbit for a while. It did some um, radio astronomy work in conjunction with the relay satellite uh, and it took pictures. Uh, and ultimately, it was impacted on the surface. Okay, so are there any instruments on this? Um, not very much. Um, it will have a camera. Uh, I think it has a laser communication device, so it's testing laser communications. Um, uh, but it's really designed to test out uh, functioning in the gateway's uh, planned orbit to make sure that it really works the way they think it will. Um, and uh, that has to do with the way the solar torques gradually tilt it so that it stays in the same orientation relative to the Earth and the Moon all the time. Uh, so that's the key there. Um, I, I don't think it has any other real scientific instruments, but it's not that's not really what it's intended for. Uh, okay, so that should go up fairly soon. This is um, uh, the gateway, uh, illustrating the gateway whose orbit um, will be tested by capstone. Uh, and uh, in this illustration, we have a, a, a gateway that has se several components, including um, uh, an Orion spacecraft docked on the left-hand side there. Uh, so that will have come from Earth carrying a crew to the gateway. Uh, and the idea is that um, uh, this gateway would enable uh, people to build up uh, the bits and pieces they need, including, for instance, uh, a lander. So they get the lander safely there, uh, maybe a, a, f a refueling system there, so the lander's all fully fueled. Then they send the people, and the people can go down to the surface. Um, Tony, do you have your? Uh, oh, yeah, no, sorry. Uh, do you have your artist rendition thing up? There we go. <laughs> oh yeah, there you go. Not real yet. That's right. Not real yet. That's right. But um, they're 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 working on it. Oh, wow, this is an artist rendering too. Better leave that label up there. So um, then uh, uh, after that, there are two two missions from two private companies in the United States um, for the uh, Commercial Lunar Payload Service, CLPS, CLPS. Um, this is a, a program to uh, allow um, uh, NASA payloads and things from other people uh, to be carried to the moon by a commercial service. Uh, Astrobotic here has about 13 or 14 NASA payloads, uh, small instruments uh, or pieces of equipment that they want to test. Um, so uh, they're on board and so are about another dozen or so uh, payloads from uh, other countries or from private entities. So for instance, um, there's a tiny little uh, legged rover like a spider uh, from the UK uh, a little wheeled rover from Japan. Um, there's a, a little wheeled rover from Cornell University. Um, all, all sorts of other things like that. There's a company that is sending cremated remains of, of some people, uh, including, I believe, Arthur C. Clarke uh, will be on this. You're telling people this time? I don't know how many people it is. 
Um, but uh, to my mind, the most significant one is uh, a woman called Maretta West, who was a US Geological Survey geologist uh, during the Apollo program uh, and who produced the, uh, the pre-mission geological map for the Apollo 11 landing site, uh, as well as doing other things uh, associated with the program. Uh, and um, her cremated remains, or like a, a gram of them, uh, will be on this um, this spacecraft as well. I don't know if uh, if, if uh, Wackerich is is listing people who will be there. I'm pretty sure MC Hammer's still alive, right? He's not going to the moon, is he? Grandma. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just listing people. Um, you yeah. notice that in my little caption here, I say that this is a mission to Lacus Mortis. Which means the lake of death. So um, oh, perhaps it's well played. There's some cremated remains on it. Uh, I don't know. Well, that's nice and morbid. <laughs> yeah, it is, I like it. It's cool. It's a good resting spot. It's very lake metal. You would you would be into that. Yeah, I'm very into that. That's fun. <laughs> About 30 kilometers north of that landing ellipse, uh, there are a couple of uh, of skylights, places where there's a kind of a collapse pit going down into a uh, a, a depression. Um, People are quite interested in looking at these. And the original plan was that Astrobotic would land very close to that. So that one of the little rovers would be able to drive across and look at it. Uh, but they've uh, um, since decided that they can't guarantee uh, a precision landing that make that useful. So uh, they've gone to a smoother area nearby instead. So anyway, that's where they're going to, to be. Um, and they should launch towards the end of the year. Don't have an exact date yet. Um, and round about the same time, or possibly pushed into early next year, uh, this company, Intuitive Machines, um, this is a company from Houston, and I should say Astrobotic is from Pittsburgh. Um, Intuitive Machines here is going to go to the Aristarchus Plateau. Uh, and again, it's carrying several NASA payloads and some commercial payloads, uh, which will also include at least one rover, I believe. Yeah, that's right. Um, so uh, there's been, there has been quite a bit of interest uh, from uh, other space agencies in flying things with these, uh, these missions. Uh, I didn't mention with Astrobotic that one of their payloads is from the Mexican Space Agency. And actually it was kind of news to me that Mexico had a space agency, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, they do. Uh, and I should say so do Colombia and Ecuador and a wide variety of other countries that you might not expect necessarily. And Colombia and Ecuador are joining together on a little satellite which will be carried by Astrobotic but left in lunar orbit uh, when their lander goes down to the surface. So everybody's getting involved in these kinds of things. Uh, Intuitive Machines here uh, is carrying several instruments that will be tested uh, before being flown on a later mission. Um, uh, so uh, this is these are important tests for NASA to do to make sure that the equipment they're flying will uh, will work properly. Uh, yeah, so um, again, we don't have an exact launch date. This shows where they intend to land, or uh, according to the most recent information anyway, they're going to fly right over a big depression called the Cobra Head. Now this place, the Aristarchus Plateau, uh, contains the biggest uh, lava channel uh, on the moon. It's called Schroter's Valley or Valley, Valley, Valles Schroteri. Um, Schroter was a German astronomer a couple of hundred years ago. Um, and uh, the source vent uh, is is the Cobra Head. That's just an informal name, but one that was in widespread use in the astronomical literature before the space age. And they'll fly right across it. And I think they hope to get high resolution images during that flyover. Um, uh, and then they'll land in that smooth area uh, further to the west there. No, oh, that's it. That's all you <laughs> Do we have any questions? I'll I'll show that later. I want to look through the chat here. We've had some good stuff. Okay. I got um, Daniel Yunt's joke. Now I didn't read the last part, but I, I <laughs> did, uh, where the creators have them and other possible YouTube puns for YouTube or for <laughs> far side features. Uh, yeah, awesome. You guys got all the comments up until now. So it's, uh, it's, uh, let's play our little trivia game. Uh, <laughs> You'll notice you both have champ pins because you tie. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, 
So, but, but, but later one of them will read Chump instead. Yes, I can. <laughs> I can do that. Um, it's a Photoshop so, on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> Last month, the game had to do with William Shatner's 90th birthday and looking at some of his films and oh yes, plot synopsis. This this month, for reasons that uh, we'll announce in a little bit for a project Tanya and I are doing. I've been reading old nature articles. Nature is a very prestigious, uh, pompous kind of uh, <laughs> journal magazine. And um, I've been reading turn of the century versions, issues of nature magazine, nature journal uh, to do with a planet, not earth, not Jupiter, but somewhere in between. And um, well, I've, I've been struck by some of the incredibly rich stories in these early nature articles so your guys's job is to guess if based on the title this is a 1921 nature article or a 1920s kids book okay Clear okay rules? yes okay uh i started with tanya last time so i'm gonna start with phil uh -oh. you ready yes <laughs> <laughs> it sounds so suspicious habits of the hedgehog you want Nature Journal or 1920s kids book? Hmm. Okay. Well, Habits of the Hedgehog. Um, okay. I'm going to say Nature Article. That is correct. It's a 1921 ah, woo. Nature Article on Habits of the Hedgehog. Tanya, you're up. Got to keep paying. Right. The Flight of Flying Fish. That's also got to be a nature article. That is a nature article. You are <laughs> one for one. Well done. Back to Phil. <laughs> a gallery of children. Well, let me see. Um, well, based on my vast experience of roulette, where you know, where you have, if 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 the ball falls on the black twice, you know it's going to be red next time. So you put uh, all your money. On the red. So I'm going to say that this is definitely a kid's book. It is, but I, I'm not that basic. I, I, I will, I will flip things around, Phil. You'll see. But you're correct for now, so you have two points. Correct for, for now. For now is the only time that matters. <laughs> <laughs> Tanya, the apparatus of Doctor Russ. Make of that what you will. 1921 Nature article or 1920s kids book. I hope it's not a kid's book, uh, yeah. but I also can't imagine what a nature article would be with that title. So children's book. Ah, oh, that's a 1921 nature article. Oh, what the hell is it about? Yeah, what was it? What was it? <laughs> it's about his apparatus. <laughs> this his... tells me you didn't actually read the article. Yeah. Danny. No, most homework? of them are just racism. I'm not going to read <laughs> Daniel, you've let us down. You should <laughs> at least be able to tell us what it is. If you're dialed in, like, so, tell us later in the comments what this paper is about. What I actually <laughs> do know about it is it, it's an obituary for, for Dr. Russ, uh, who had invented some sort of apparatus. apparatus. <laughs> I, didn't, uh, I didn't read what said apparatus was. It, I assume it was a, a, a scientific instrument. Not the leather apparatus, but I think it was a gigantic pair of pincers for ripping out teeth. It was an early dental instrument. That's what I think. That sounds good. We'll go with that. Okay. I think this sounds like Danny. You sound like a, a kid who was trying to do a book report, but like didn't read the book. <laughs> well, I'm reading the articles on Mars, not the. Article. You gave it away. Well, you know. uh, mm. so we're back to Phil, who has a two to one lead. Uh, there's only four, so you only get four each. So um, Phil can really put a commanding lead here. The story of mankind. Well, it's a kid's book. Oh. <laughs> what? So, yeah, no, you're right. It's a kid's book. Oh, oh I am. <laughs> Why do you sound bad? <laughs> no, I just, I like it to be close. We'll see. We'll see how Tanya does on this next one. Not me. I'm getting competitive now. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to be so disappointing. <laughs> so it's, it's three, one. But this is Tanya's third. Gold colored teeth of sheep. Oh, that's a nature article. It is. Yeah. Three, two. <laughs> that could have been a kid's book. 
Phil, <laughs> millions of cats. <laughs> mm. Kids book. Uh, yeah, you are correct. <laughs> oh, I was kind of hoping it was a nature article. <laughs> yeah, I was. I I would like to read that. That one you would have read. Yes, I would. Have. I definitely would. Have. All right. Uh, so, so Phil has already won, but we'll see if Tanya can make it respectable with at least a uh, a, a three points. Earthworms <laughs> drowned in puddles. Oh no! Tragic. N uh, nature article. Yeah, it is. It's a little dark for a children's book. <laughs> yeah, I think twenties so. is a tough time. Kids were tough back then. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, they were they were just seeing if you could drown earthworms. So, science. Scientists are kind of messed up. <laughs> yep. Right. Well, they're your people. Are these the same people who chop worms in half and say, oh, look, they're both wriggling. They're both going to live. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> what if we drown them as well? <laughs> All right. Well, Phil, Phil wins. He gets the, the pin next month. Oh, oh wow. Cass says earthworms can't drown. Ooh. Well, in Cass, you tell us more. That <laughs> yeah, tell us more, Cass. Because in 1921, you would have been the dissenting opinion, <laughs> been arguing that these earthworms died of natural causes <laughs> after they were submerged by scientists. <laughs> I'll I'll have to. I mean, Cass is uh, is the same uh, uh, access to the Nature Archives, but mm. I'll read this in depth now. Um, there was actually a flurry of letters exchanged on this. Um, oh. There was another article entitled "Why Do Worms Die," uh, <laughs> which I, I assume was related to them being drowned. Hmm. Huh. I I'm glad that this was like a hot topic of scientific discourse in the twenties. <laughs> we really Still need to know how to kill these earthworms. Yeah, that's right. It's not like there was anything important happening around the world that had to be dealt with at the time. No, no, no <laughs> global pandemics or anything that have been recently uh, ravaging the planet. Um, Phil is suggesting that we submit a hundred year old uh, response that we refute. I, I mean, it sets up the cast. Cast should be refuting this claim. Oh, cast. So this does make sense. They don't have lungs. But well, so now the, this is a good technicality question. Does drowning require like inhaling water or like can they die because they can't like respirate through i don't know how worms breathe that's not what my yeah. phd is in do they just like I respirate just, through their skin my understanding of drowning is that it's when your lungs fill up with water but i could be wrong which would make Cass's claim strong that if they okay. don't it's how could they drown but i don't know if that was taken into account in the scientific experiment maybe it was dr russ or whatever <laughs> and his earthworm. Oh, there, there's our new children's book, Doctor Russ and his earthworm apparatus. Doctor Russ. Wait, that sounds earthworms. really. Bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Doctor Russ and his wormy apparatus. Oh God! <laughs> Please, I I redact everything I just said in the last thirty seconds. I'm just Daniel Young um, points okay. out that uh, earthworms are used for fishing, and they don't drown when you're when they're in there for a while, which is I know that because I no they they get eaten by some point. fish. Well, yeah. Another way don't. to kill them. <laughs> oh man, we could do a whole science experiment on. Yeah. This well, makes me think of the tardigrade science experiment that we used to do with yeah. kids at when CPSX was still a thing, where we had where we we're trying to teach them that tardigrades are indestructible, except apparently when you give them to twelve year olds and they're really good at murdering them in things like microwaves. Oh. Um, okay. Yeah, it's a little wow. depressing. They can survive like in space right. and radiation and like all this other stuff, but they can only survive if the change in conditions is really slow. So these students oh. would like put them in the microwave and they would die because you know the microwave cooks them immediately. Yeah, it's, uh, hmm. it's very sad. I, mean, I don't think they in do the that experiment anymore. <laughs> barring the fact that a microwave would have been a miracle, <laughs> microwaving tardigrades would have been a nature article. That's true. Uh, we missed our opportunity. Mm. We really came. Well, here. You guys came to science late because it was it was much easier back then. <laughs> All right. Well, fun. Um, yeah, we'll be back. I'm still pissed off that I forgot about Luna Nine and said oh. the first landing. Like that's. I mean, that's also speaking against the union, right? You know. 
<laughs> like that's speaking against the regime. Um, <laughs> Nine was the first great glorious success of the empire uh, and Luna 10 and then the Americans did some things, but what matters is Luna 9 <laughs> landing on the surface of the moon. Um, there's a t-shirt in there somewhere. There's a what? There's a t-shirt in the stuff that you just said somewhere. And we're still trying to figure out exactly where that landing site is. We have rough, you have on Luna 9? I have rough coordinates, but uh, not very exact. And uh, it, the site hasn't been identified yet. Hmm. That seems, wow. That's, well, that's it's going to be very difficult to find. Yeah. Luna 9 itself is tiny. Uh, it would only be a couple of mm. pixels across in an LRO image. Um, I think the best hope to identify it uh, and to be able to distinguish it from just rocks uh, would be to be able to match the pattern of craters seen in the Lunar 9 images around the lander. So if you, you make a map showing where the craters are in the Lunar 9 panorama, uh, and then you try to find that pattern of craters with a little lump in the middle, that would be Lunar 9. But Luna in itself won't look any different from a rock, probably. So it'd be very difficult to find. Cool. Yeah. There'd be no change comparison to do because you wouldn't have any images. No. Okay. No. Well, just more reason to keep mapping. Mm -hmm. um, so before we get going, Tanya, do you have any events coming up in the next month? Oh, probably, but I don't have my Google <laughs> Calendar up. <so. laughs> So I don't remember, but I, I will put in a plug because I said earlier that oh, yeah, I would. Yeah. So um, if you want to help support the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, which is obviously, you know, having a tough time right now because of COVID, none of the Smithsonian's are actually open to the public at the moment. Um, they are selling a bunch of cool Ingenuity swag, uh, mm. T-shirts mm. and and posters and bags and all sorts of cool stuff. This is just one of the designs that they have. Um, you can get all of this stuff at marsrovermerch.com, which honestly, I'm really mad that I didn't buy that domain name before they did because it's a really good domain name. Um, nice. Yes, thank you to the Air and Space Museum for sending me this mug. Um, support the museum by getting your Ingenuity swag there. This is, I guess, sponsored in that they mailed me a mug, but like, I don't make any money off of this. This is all for the museum. So like- What you do make money off of to pay your bills is for all oh, the money. Ah, available true. now. We're you all gotta hold it closer to the camera. Oh yeah, I forgot, I'm, I'm away now, further away. <laughs> it's uh, the 350th best selling book in uh, one of the categories on Amazon, so. <laughs> yeah, help us become the number one book in moon stuff on Amazon. Oh, there you go. Yeah, we had that for like a week, so. You can get we it. were number one in aeronautics and astronautics. Ah, uh, yes, because of all the aeronautics I write about. <laughs> and it's definitely a book about aeronautics. <laughs> yes. It's yeah. not heartwarming stories about people's experiences of the greatest event in exploration history. It's just an uh, aeronautics textbook. <laughs> <laughs> um, Phil, you, uh, well, you can be followed on uh, Unmanned Space Flight if you mm -hmm. want to get straight, want to get the tea straight from Phil. Uh, uh, you go to that website and you see him mapping things and following missions. Uh, I don't. I imagine you probably don't have any talks coming up. Um, uh, no, I just did one for Space Day at Western. Oh yeah, uh, how'd that go? Something else lined up. Um, but uh, I'm going to be spending the next little while looking out for a new activity on Mars, of course, with uh, a couple more flights by Ingenuity, uh, and then hopefully uh, uh, seeing Perseverance actually start its science traverse. Cool. I've been reading this. So good. So good. Ah. Much more than old nature articles. <laughs> you got to hold it closer to the camera again, Danny. <laughs> I'm not a, a, a salesperson like you are. There you go. <laughs> I can barely yeah, remember the lunar either. mission order. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah. buy this book. Yeah, then you won't forget. Well, it's the Mars. Yeah, don't forget mission orders like I did today. So I, I am working hard at keeping track of what uh, all the current missions are doing on Mars for a third volume in that series. Nice. All right. And uh, we will compete with you on the book market. One of these. Uh, okay. <laughs> you need to get them to release all three as like a box set because like I don't have the first two. So right. I need yeah, to be able to buy all of them. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes. I have an autographed copy, so. Because you're special. <laughs> All right, we're uh, we're at nine o'clock here. So those of you who joined us live and stayed for the whole thing, thank you so much. That's awesome. Uh, it really means a lot to have you joining live. Of course, if you're watching this in the archives, that's awesome too. Um, so thank you very much from Phil, Tanya, and myself. And we'll see you in a month with more space exploration. Okay. Yeah, and be sure to write in the comments if you have specific things that you want to hear us cover. Uh, we are always happy to take suggestions from the audience. Great. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.